mercy and peace are yours in abundance. From God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 11, collected <coughs> verses. I am talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient, in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. So far our text. Dear Christian friends, as you look back into history, have there ever been bad ideas? Let me offer a couple for you. <laughs> and I know some of these clothing are coming back, but as someone who was born in 1976, I look back in the 70s and say, what were they thinking? <laughs> or maybe the music that went along with this ball. It's a little rough for my attuned ears and the fine culture that I have. <laughs> But some people think it's good too, and that's okay. And on this Sunday, we're talk, kind of talking about a few bad ideas. And the, Paul, the Apostle Paul lists out almost kind of a confusing bad idea that fits together like a glove when you look at the other lessons. So we're going to look through those. But as Gunnar so astutely pointed out, this is good news of great joy for all. Jesus is for all people. But to get there, the church kind of had to go through well, a few bumps. And I wonder sometimes if we don't have to do the same. Because I kind of like how I dress and the music that I listen to. I'm very comfortable. And so if someone makes me uncomfortable, I don't like it. But I think sometimes my God forces us out of our comfort zone. So that that good news of great joy might be for all people. There are some bad ideas recorded on the pages of Scripture in your worship folder. The first one was from the book of Numbers. You go to Numbers 24, and it's really kind of a horrifying chunk of Scripture. God's people were walking through a foreign land, and the king of the land, Barak, hired a guy named Balaam. And he said, hey, if I pay you some money, can you curse Israel? And he said, sure. <clears throat> This is all going to end in a horrifying nightmare disaster for God's people. Except that the Almighty steps in. And instead of allowing Balaam to curse God's people, he just blesses them three times. And the guy who paid him gets irate. And Balaam's like, what do you want from me? God's in charge here. It's a neat portion of scripture. And that's the only chunk where we get to see the prophecy that a star will rise. That's the only hint of it. There might be more that these wise men knew. Daniel was over there. A bunch of prophets from the captivity that we don't know a whole lot about. Ezekiel. And so it's possible that other people knew about the Savior, even if it's not recorded in Scripture for us to know. The wise men found Jesus. And <coughs> that's kind of the next bad idea. You want to start walking for how long? Years? I, I can't, if, if I go longer than two hours, my kids are like, well, why are we here? I need a movie. Like, th this is not a fair trip, Dad. Walking for years. We call that a sabbatical, don't we? We'd have to give up everything and go. But they knew that at the end of the light of that star, they would find God. And the wise men were the first people who weren't Jews whom God bent over backwards to make sure they got there. The star shone down on the house. I've seen many Bible classes and many <coughs> illustrations you go on YouTube. It's pretty elaborate how you can roll back the cosmos with computer technology and see exactly what the stars are doing. The last time I checked, stars don't shine down like a beacon on a house. 
But God made sure that these wise men knew where to go. It's beautiful. And we're going to talk about in this epiphany season how you might be that light that can bring people to Jesus. Well, I want to show you another bad idea. There's so many. This was the Dyson, the very first one. The root cyclone. Yes, you didn't need a bang. Do you know that Mr. Dyson spent seven years trying to get someone to buy his vacuum and no one wanted it? Do you know why? Hoover, we have a Hoover vacuum right here, right now, in our church. Hoover had a $500 million a year industry in vacuum bags. So when Mr. Dyson rolls up with his bagless vacuum, do you know what they told him? Nobody. <laughs> no, we, we don't want that. So after seven years, I think he made his own company. And he got the means of distribution, and they flew off the shelves, and now every vacuum, including the Hoover, doesn't have a bag. And I got to say, when you look at the first verse of our text, you're kind of at the same place. Let's look at verse 13. I'm talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arise my own people to envy and save some of them. I take pride in my ministry. That can be literally rendered, if you look back at the Greek, render it glorious. That's what he did of his ministry. Paul made a big deal out of the blessings that he was gleaning as he went out to the Gentiles so that the Jews would get jealous. So that they might think, man, is this like a bagless vacuum? Is Jesus really that cool? Should we give him a second look? He sounded like a bad idea. Jesus, are you kidding me? We got our whole Jewish system. We got our Savior of the world lined up. But Jesus didn't fit that bill. He wasn't political. He didn't throw off Rome. Eh. Yeah. He was the genuine article. Jesus was, in fact, the Savior of the world. Thousands of Gentiles across Rome can't be long. Can't be wrong. Verse 15. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? This might be a jump in logic when you first hear that verse. I'll read it again. For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Reconciliation means you and your friend are, they have beef, as my kids would say. You're arguing. And someone steps in, or you guys talk it out. And now you are back together. You are reconciled. All right? For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Paul went to the Jews first. <coughs> they didn't want him. They rejected him. Peter got a special vision a few times to go and visit a centurion, a Roman, a pagan. And he did. And he shared the gospel with them. And this is a big deal in the book of Acts. They went out of his way to go talk to a Gentile. The Apostle Paul, the modus operandi, we talked about the how you go about things, how we roll. Best practice in the early Christian church for doing mission work is you go to a new town, you might as well find the Jews, right? They're looking for a savior, in theory. He goes there, he says, guys, guess what? We found him. He came. His name is Jesus. He died for your sins. More often than not, Paul's put up on his ear, and he doesn't go to the market and pout. He stands up in the agora, the market, and he tells anyone who will listen, guess what? I know not only who God is, but I know who your Savior is. And a lot of the Gentiles looked at him with a yawn, but some of them believed. And that was amazing. But, in doing so, a lot of the Jews who see this happening go, what, what are these Gentiles, why are they turning away from their pagan gods and believing in this Jewish God that we at first rejected? It's a little complicated circle. But Paul comes back around and says, guess what? The Jews are believing again. Verse 28, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For as God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Here again, a lot to unpack. 
As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. Yes, it's true the Jews, well, they tried to kill Paul a few times. Um, some of them took a fast, meaning they wouldn't eat until Paul was dead. They really didn't like him. They were, in fact, enemies of the gospel, a lot of them. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't love them, and that God didn't want them in his church. That was the irrevocable call. And so I have to ask you, think about the last person that you would want sitting next to you in church. Is it someone from another culture? Is it maybe someone in your own family? Is it maybe someone speaking a different language? What about someone who has a different sexual orientation than you? What a political party. Would they be welcome in Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church? Was Gunnar wrong? Is the gospel not for all people? Of course, our God says that he is for all. And as we search our own hearts to chase that away and beat it down and frankly repent, if that attitude ever gets in there at all, when I first came here, someone called me up and asked me if I had a white or black church, and I responded, it's red brick. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. And so I want to tell you a story that kind of breaks down exactly what matters. But first, hear these next few verses. Paul lays it out. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient, in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Again, Paul lays out this circle. He shows up for the Jews, they reject him. He goes to the Gentiles. The Jews were rejecting Jesus at this point, but they got jealous. They said, well, let's check out Jesus again, and then this circle comes all the way around. And Paul says this is good. Romans, Gentiles who are Christians, let the Jews in. Be nice to them. Give them another chance. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. I want to take you back to Vienna, Austria. This is 1622. That is the crypt of the Habsburg Empire. And um, it is in a Capuchin monastery. Capuchins like mendicant. It's a begging order. Um, These are different groups of monks in the Catholic Church. The Capuchins are one of them. Well, they happen to be in charge of the Habsburg crypt. For hundreds of years, these were king. Well, did you know that the final spot in the Capuchin crypt was filled by Princess Yolanda de Lingen? She was the wife of the Archduke of Austria. She uh, turned 100 back in May of last year, and she died in September. And now she um, is the last body that was moved into the crypt. But you don't just walk down to the crypt with the dead body and get in. There's, of course, some pomp and circumstance that goes around with it. It's pretty cool. If you wanted to get down there, the capuchin monk knows that you're coming, of course. And there is a funeral pr procession with a wagon with a coffin on it. And there's a herald in the front. And the herald walks up to the door and the capuchin says, who demands entry? And the last guy, we don't have a record of what happened uh, with Yolanda, but the last guy who they did this for was back in 2011. His name was Otto. He had 49 titles. I'm going to list them all for you in the blog post tomorrow, but um, he was the former crown prince of Austria-Hungary, and it just goes on forever. But after you do all of these names that take almost two minutes to rattle off, the capuchin monk says at the door, I don't know it. To which the herald just kind of sits there for a second, and then the monk goes back. Who demands entry? And then they list off different titles, like he loved pets, he did meals on wheels, something like that. And then the capuchin monk says, I don't know. It. And then the third time, the monk says, Who demands entry? And the herald says the third time, a poor sinner. At that point, the door opens. And the king is allowed to go in. <laughs> now, that is beautiful because these people were a little messed up when you look over the history of these empires. 
But wow, is that spot on. God does not care who you are or what you did. The reason you gain entry is because you are a poor sinner. For God has bound all men over to disobedience, that he might have mercy on them. It is a beautiful picture that one day you will get to go in to heaven. God doesn't open up the door to some crypt. doesn't matter what happens to your body. He opens up the door to heaven. Because you're a poor sinner who has received grace. Jesus won that for you when he died on the cross. Nothing can change that status of you being forgiven. And nothing can stop that from going out to the whole world. That is a true statement. This is good news of great joy for all people. Epiphany is all about revealing that. And in the season of Epiphany, as you go through these Sundays, you're going to see Jesus reveal himself. And that starts off a new sermon series. And I want to show you this one minute video as the intro. same eyewitness account. And then we go into the season of Lent. Dear friends, we see Jesus' glory in the season of Epiphany. And one of the ways we see that is how this is good news of great joy for all people. Amen. Please stand. God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> 